panelists as well. Kia ora. We're also going to be live streaming to YouTube. Um, we'll post the link in the chat if you want to invite your Fano and your friends uh, to join us there. Um, so just whilst we're still waiting for people to join, Marama, how was your day? Well, James, um, these are quite busy times for you and I, I'm aware. Um, I got distracted in between one Zoom call trying to get some food and instead rolled around on the floor with my uh, little baby mokopuna. <laughs> so missed out on the sandwich. But um, also today, James, of course, uh, I had the Epidemic Response Select Committee. And today, interestingly, it was also focused on the future, on how do we want to redesign or reimagine um, the Aotearoa that uh, will be good for all of us. So uh, having another good day, James, how are you? Yeah, I'm also good. Um, I'm very aware that I'm in quite a privileged position and that I have a separate office at home that I can work from and my technology will work. So the transition uh, from the office to working from home has been reasonably smooth for me personally, but I'm aware that uh, that, that experience is not necessarily widely shared um, by either my colleagues or, or much of the rest of the country. But like you, I've spent much of the day on Zoom. Um, whilst you were on the uh, pandemic select committee, uh, I was with the COVID-19 cabinet committee of ministers working through uh, sort of a, a set of technical issues to do with how the support program is, is rolling out. Um, and so, and other issues about that. But, you know, like you, uh, actually a lot of my day has been spent on material that actually relates to the topics of, uh, of tonight's discussion. Um, it's great to see uh, so many people coming online for this discussion on reimagining our communities. Just a reminder to those of you, if you've just joined, um, please fill out our poll asking which region you're from. You can use the chat function, which if you're new to Zoom is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and add, you can ask a question there and there'll be time at the end of the session uh, for us to discuss some of those questions. Our panelists tonight are Dr. Ganesh Nana, who is Burl's uh, Research Director, Councillor Tamitha Paul from the Wellington City Council, and Professor Philippa Howden Chapman from Otago University's Department of Public Health. Uh, I want to thank you, James, actually, for reminding me um, how privileged we are. And, and certainly I've been very grateful uh, for being able to set up working from home. I know that many people are in so many different situations across the country. And I think it's it's always, well, it's why we're here, actually. We're here to reimagine an Aotearoa where everyone's able to live some decent lives. Um, I'm really looking forward to this important discussion tonight, uh, which is exactly that, how we want New Zealand to look post COVID-19. We've got a chance to have some really inspirational uh, discussions and, and share some ideas. And this is that great opportunity, particularly for us as the Green Party. I'm, I'm really keen to look at the interconnections between protecting our climate for our future mokopuna and generations. Um, conserving our beautiful um, natural world and our living systems and um, inequality and making sure that everybody has what they need to live good lives. Uh, so these are some of the things that I think will come up tonight. I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, thank you all to those of you who are joining us on this Zoom tonight. The purpose here is to start the discussion on reimagining our communities. Now, this has also been live streamed on YouTube, and the link is in the chat uh, if you want to invite your Fano and your friends to watch. Soon, uh, we'll be bringing in our panelists, Dr. Ganesh Nana, Councillor Tamitha Paul, and Professor Philippa Howden Chapman. They'll come on one at a time to discuss what's on their minds uh, and their reimagining of Aotearoa New Zealand post COVID 19. Then we'll have a full panel discussion on the topics that each of them has raised, and there will be time for your questions uh, later on in the show. Um, but Marama, before uh, we bring on our panelists, um, I have been uh, thinking uh, recently a lot about the, uh, the rollout of the COVID-19 uh, recovery program. Historically, when uh, we have, not just here in New Zealand, but around the world, when we have some kind of economic crisis, and they do occur about every 10 years on average. Nothing like the scale of what we're seeing at the moment, but our entirely natural human response is to say, well, look, can we just make things go back the way they were before? 
um, I just want I just want it to get back to normal. Um, and so, not surprisingly, I guess governments here in New Zealand and around the world uh, try to fulfil that expectation um, and uh, pour an enormous amount of money into restoring the status quo. Now, unfortunately, um, the status quo was a highly polluting, unsustainable model uh, that was locking in um, climate, a pathway towards climate change. And we can't afford to do that uh, one more time. We're, out, we're actually out of time. Uh, and so um, given that we are currently borrowing tens of billions of dollars off our children and off our grandchildren to get us through this current crisis, and if we fail to avert the climate crisis, technically we're also borrowing tens of billions off our children and grandchildren because they've got to pay for the costs of adapting to the effects of climate change. I think that we've got a, a moral responsibility uh, and an opportunity to use that investment uh, and, and, and that money that, we that we're borrowing off future generations for this crisis to actually solve the climate crisis and some of the other long-term challenges facing New Zealand, like the housing crisis or the crisis in our rivers uh, and in, with our urban water. Um, and so uh, that's kind of been weighing a lot on my mind um, over the course uh, of, the, of the last few um, weeks. And as we start to think about some of the big investments that we're about to make, uh, thinking about how we can use those things um, to solve long-term problems. So, of course, uh, over the weekend, we um, said publicly that we were hoping that rather than investing tens of billions of dollars in motorways as part of the recovery program, we could uh, get regional fast passenger rail going between, say, Hamilton and Auckland and Tauranga, Whangare uh, on the one hand, or Wellington and Masterton, Wellington and uh, Palmerston North on the other, Christchurch and Timaru, uh, and and so on, um, and 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 the response to that's been been terrific. Um, but that's me. <laughs> what have you been thinking about recently? Oh, all of those things as well, James, um, and the connection that they have to some of the inequalities, the um, where some people just don't have enough and. Uh, a lot of people also have more than they will ever need. Those have been sort of highlighted through what is happening around the world and here in Aotearoa. Um, and these inequalities that have been here for decades and generations, in fact. So I'm now thinking, uh, well, I'm now thinking, I've been thinking for a long time, as many of us have, how do we ensure that everybody, everybody has a warm, safe, affordable and secure, healthy home and one that can meet the climate and environmental challenges uh, that we are all facing already, but that um, will become even a, a bigger challenge as, as we go on. Um, and I'm really proud, for example, of the first uh, climate safe house that I helped to launch maybe some months ago in Waitati, in Dunedin, which was a grassroots community led project in partnership with uh, local businesses, uh, with um, community organisations, with tangata whenua, um, and it was in response to help provide a community with a house that could withstand some of the flooding problems that are um, a, a bit of a characteristic in, in that particular area. These are the inspirational projects and, and thoughts um, that are around the country, and how can we, uh, how can we talk about that in every community, in every neighbourhood, in every region, um, bringing people together to provide a response uh, to some of these big issues. I've been thinking a lot right now, as, as you know, James, I don't know, um, we have the majority of New Zealanders will be needing and are already on a form of income support with the help of the government. Um, whether that's uh, individuals, um, families, uh, businesses, people who have just um, lost their job for many COVID reasons and or other reasons, people who are in um, low paid jobs and need extra top up support to be able to afford the high costs. And I wonder um, what is the modern welfare or income support, social support system that a wonderful country like ours can have 
um, where we all understand that actually people are simply trying to do their best with what they have, that we all um, have a, a social contract or understanding that a, a, an income support system should provide people with help and rather than a punitive approach. And I'm proud of the big achievements we've made in that area. Um, I'm really pleased to see the immediate $25 increase across core benefits in response to COVID-19. We know we've got a lot more work to make sure that people have got enough um, to live above the poverty line, to feed their children healthy kai, pay the rent and pay the power bill all at the same time. And I think finally, um, I've just been thinking a lot about uh, the, the groups who have and the people who have the least support and the least resource, uh, we've got to make sure everyone has enough income, um, whether you are in paid employment or not, to live those decent lives. We've got to make sure we have a world fit for everyone, including our disabled people. Um, that are not disabled further by the way we design our houses and our buildings and our public transport and all of our public spaces and our workplaces. We've got to make sure that um, we have a, a, a way of allowing and, um, and supporting um, disabled people and all people who want to and are able to be in employment into paid employment. Um, we've got a lot of work to do to mop up a lot of areas that we haven't been doing so well in, but we've shown very quickly when there is a will, we can act urgently. We removed thousands of people from the streets and from living rough into a, a warm, safe uh, place of shelter. And we did that very quickly. Those are some of the thoughts and the opportunities that I'm already seeing, James, um, that have been inspiring me over these past uh, couple of couple of few weeks as well. Yeah, I think there are two things that have really stood out to me. Um, you know, one of which is just how utterly we depend on uh, essential workers who are some of the lowest paid uh, people in our society, um, and how difficult it was to. Um, you know, convince people that they needed a, a, a decent living wage. Um, and actually now it's just really clear that actually our society <laughs> cannot function uh, at a minimal level without them. Um, and the other is, as you say, just what's possible uh, when um, something like this happens. And, and so actually if we were capable of treating some of those other crises with the same sense of boldness, decisiveness and urgency, um, we could actually fix those too. All great points to discuss with our first panellist. Um, before that though, if you've just joined the meeting uh, on reimagining our communities, thank you very much for coming along. Marama and I have just spent the last 10 minutes talking about um, what excites us about the possibilities that we see uh, in this um, extraordinary time. And we've got some amazing panellists to add to those possibilities and to those reimaginings tonight. After all of our panelists have come on, there will be time for some questions at the end. So please, if you've got a question, add it to the chat uh, and we'll try and pick up as many of those uh, that we can at the end. Now, our first panelist is Dr. Ganesh Nana, who is the research director uh, at Burl. And we're just gonna wait for Dr. Nana to join us. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. I hope you and your family have been okay over the last uh, few weeks. Um, Dr. Nana, tell us, what's on your mind in terms of reimagining our communities? Well, firstly, kia ora and kia ora tato to all your viewers and listeners, and um, thank you for inviting me along. Um, I suppose the and just picking up on some of the thoughts that you and, and Marma expressed just a little while ago, I think the the most the thing that hits me most is this idea that we're all going to go back to business as usual, and this is just a minor glitch, and um, well, not so minor. It's a little bit of a big glitch, but uh, with a bit of um, hand waving and a bit of magic out there, we'll all suddenly go back to business as usual, and um, and uh, it will be just yet another page in the history books, and I think we've actually got to realise a bit of work to be done to actually make or to convince communities and businesses and all our people that this is a huge change. It's a huge shock. All of us 
Um, and I think it's perfectly normal. All of us want to go back to something that we're comfortable with, which is, you know, something that happened a little while ago and, and it makes us feel comfortable. So we all are in this state of shock and, and yearning for something comfortable. But I think the, the biggest or most important thing that would, one would hope comes out of this is a realisation that actually we need government. And there's a huge, huge, big role for government to play in the future of New Zealand. And we've had essentially a generation of New Zealanders, or probably more, you know, the last four decades effectively, where we've been brainwashed with this idea that government is bad. And so we've got to limit government and we tie it up with all these responsibility acts and all of these rules and that there's this, the stuff that it's not allowed to do because it's not allowed to grow big. Um, because big government is bad, so we've got to make it small. And I think that's what's, that's going to be a huge mind shift and definitely for a lot of New Zealanders and dare I say a lot of young New Zealanders who don't know any different. And I'm thinking of some of the economists and, and indeed business people that I know of who have been brought up through this idea that it's only the market that works and go, good government is small government and get, get government out of the way. Well, actually this fast realisation that actually we need government. We all need government, whether we're families or whanau or whether we're business people. You know, businesses have been one of the first to be in the queue for um, the support. And and, and I don't um, criticise that, but we've, we've now wrapping ourselves up with a, a safety net, effectively, to keep as many of us inside the safety net for the next, um, for the recovery, whenever that might come. And that safety net is not just people, that is businesses and, and, and people's livelihoods and so on. And I think we've got to realise and admit that actually we might've got it wrong a little while ago and actually government is a force for good. And, and by government, I mean both local and central government. Local government has got a big part to play into the future. We can talk about the funding of it a bit later, but to me, that, to me that's a, a, a second order importance. The big importance is to make New Zealanders understand and realise and indeed value the importance of government. Um, and a lot of that I think has got to do with how we include people in government. People, people have got to see themselves as being um, represented and included in that government. They need to see themselves um, having, a, having a stake in the game. And I think that's, that's a bit of a mindset, mindset shift uh, not just for businesses, but for New Zealanders. And um, alongside that, I think the other big mind shift is, is around, why are we here? You know, what's our objective? What's our kaupapa? And businesses have these great things, you know, the directors go on a, go on a retreat for a couple of days and argue about their values and where they put the commas on their, uh, on their value and mission statements. And then they go up on the website and the glossy brochures, and then we forget about them and, you know, we actually got to take those things for real and we've actually got to take them. What is our objective? And, I, and in my mind, the best representation in New Zealand is actually local government, which actually have the four well-beings as the purpose of local government. It's enacted in legislation. And it'd be nice to get that beyond the legislation and actually into the decision making. So those four well-beings are not nice to have. Um, you know, there's, there's economic, there's social, there's uh, cultural and there's environment. Those are the four well-beings. And unfortunately, the way it's interpreted is in, in some council says, well, what's the most important of those well-beings? Well, it's economic. So we've got to look after the financial balance sheet and everything else. Or what's the end? Some people say, oh, no, it's environment. That's the most important. Or what? And actually, in my mind, we've got to understand that all four of those well-beings are just so important together. None of them are any more or less important than the other. And when we start looking at that as our kaupapa, the not max like ensuring the well-being of current and future generations that's the wording of the legislation uh, and then we can start looking at success based on that rather than the current models whether it's business or community which is around literally more is better whether it's gdp or the number of or the amount of milk coming out of the cow or the number of sheep you've got on the grass or what you, you know that that's the fundamental um model of our economy at the moment it's more is better and we've got to turn that around and actually say, well, no, well-being is the, is the framework. That's the foundation. That's our objective. And we start talking about resources, not as things we use, but resources as something that um, we want to get some good stuff out of it. But their most fundamental, most important role in being here is that those resources are not ours. Let's not get into the ownership argument. Those resources were given to us by our, by our tupuna. 
and it's up to us to look after them and make sure that we can pass them on to our mokopuna. That's, in my mind, that's what economics is all about. It's not about the allocation of resources and who owns it. It's actually how do we look after them. And that's my mind in terms of you're talking about reimagining communities, reimagining business. We don't look at resources as, you know, things to, to gobble up and spit out the other end and we get more. It's we've got these resources. They are precious. They are our treasures. They are our taonga. So as, if you're really economist, my mind is actually economics is all about being kaitiakitanga of our taonga. And that's, you know, that's the world I'd dearly love to get into and in, in, in trying to push the very much in terms of local government talking to councils today, trying to get them past the, you know, the first thing is getting past the austerity argument and then getting them out of the business as usual and then actually start thinking about, don't forget your kaupapa, which is the four well-beings. So let's make them front and centre. I've talked for too long. I'll leave that for you. No, um, I could listen to this inspirational stuff all night, actually, Ganesh. And I wanted to pick up on... You reminded me of something I I used to help me express those connections. Um, I'll I'll let everyone uh, listen to this phrase, Mateoranga o te taiao, kaurai tiwi, mo te taki tini, kaure mo te toru toru anake. And in English, it sort of means through the well-being of our environment, our people will thrive. Um, for the many and not just for the few. And I often look to that uh, to sort of make those very quick connections about us as custodians, as kaitiaki, as you pointed out, Ganesh, mm -hmm. and um, how we are interdependent on Papatuanuku having healthy soil, water, air, and a climate we can all thrive in. And uh, our environment is dependent on us being able to live humane lives and dignified lives so that we can also contribute to nourishing our living systems rather than degrading them and so I, for me I think uh, you know I also want to acknowledge um, and then I'm keen on James picking up some thoughts I want to acknowledge you Ganesh also for your um, leadership role on the welfare expert advisory group you were one of the incredible leaders and panelists we had a diverse group of people on that who did incredible research into our system and um, I'm so proud of that work that we were able to get through with this government and it's given us a, a blueprint, a guide for how we can improve and have a have a modern welfare system. But James, I'm, I'm keen on what your thoughts are. Well no, I'm just um, delighted to hear uh, an economist talk about um, the idea that economics isn't just about how you divvy up resources in the present, it's about how we receive them from our ancestors and pass them on to our descendants. So that's um, fabulous to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, kia ora, Ganesh. If we can please ask you to stay on the line, yeah. keep, your, keep your camera on for all of us. I am now very pleased to bring on our next um, guest, our next panellist, who is Councillor Tamitha Paul of Wellington City Council. There you go. Kia ora, Tamitha. Thank you so much. Um, kia ora, Councillor. Thank you so much for your time with us tonight. Uh, you've been, we've all been in lockdown over this time. Um, I'm going to ask you what has been on your mind in terms of reimagining our communities. Well, uh, kia ora my tato. I just wanted to uh, quickly mihi to uh, you, Dr. Nana, for your whakaaro rangatira. Uh, totally on board with everything that you've just said. And, and a massive mihi uh, kia koru, uh, uh, Marama and James for, for prompting this. I think it's absolutely important that we have these kōrero uh, in, in lieu of being able to do it in, in real life or, or physically. So um, kia ora koutou, a, a massive kia ora to everybody joining in. Ko Tamitha Paul tōku ingoa, uh, he uri tēnei no Ngāti Awa me Waikato Tainui hoki. Uh, my name's Tamitha Paul, I'm a 22-year-old city councillor in Wellington, our beautiful capital. Um, I have the climate change, youth and city safety portfolios. Um, so I've been thinking a lot lately about this particular whakatauki actually, and it is kapu te ruha, kahau te rangatahi. And it essentially speaks to what Dr. Nana has just said. And it talks about if the old net is cast aside, then we create a new net to go fishing with. And frankly, the net that we have currently in Aotearoa sucks. It catches no fishes and screws us all over. And I reckon we need to make a new one. 
Um, and I think COVID-19 has seriously put a magnifying glass um, on the existing inequalities in our communities. Um, and, and, and for some people actually, this is their first time actually seeing the inequalities that we have, seeing the way that essential workers are treated, uh, seeing that, um, you know, the, the, the pay levels that some of these people are receiving. And um, I, I think that, you know, the thank yous to our essential workers and subsidies for those workers, you know, they, they are things that will help us get us through this period right now, but actually they're just a band-aid on a problem uh, that's a lot bigger than, than COVID-19 actually and has existed in this country since colonization. Um, on Tuesday night, myself and Thomas Nash, who is a regional councillor, Green Party, um, Wellington Regional Councillor, we were able to talk to Kate Rayworth. So she's an international economist and she came up with this theory uh, called Donut Economics. And um, it's, 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 um, and that's, I've been thinking about that quite a lot too, because obviously Amsterdam and, and um, some other countries have adopted these donut models. But I'm thinking, what does one look like in Aotearoa when we actually know that prior to um, Te Tiriti and everything that went on before, um, you know, during that time, we actually had systems and ways of doing things that are special to all of us here in Aotearoa, you know, that, that tikanga Māori or kaupapa Māori way of living is something that we can all own, all of us here in Aotearoa, it is not specific to any particular culture. So, for those who don't know, um, the donut economic kind of framework is really straightforward. So you have a donut. I, I can see some of the comments saying, hmm, I know, I'm going to have a guy after this too. The out, so, so in a donut, you've got the outer circle and you've got the inner circle. So using it in an economic philosophy, the outer, the outer circle here is representing our ecological ceiling. So this is really the limits of the environment. So it's talking about our riverways, our air. Um, our, our ngahiri, our forests, our, our biodiversity, that is our ecological ceiling and we should never go outside of that or exploit that. On the inside of the donut, that's our social kind of, our social net there and that's the real fundamental social need. So that's access to clean water, adequate housing, to healthcare, everything that has always mattered but is kind of, you know, we've put a magnifying glass on that during COVID. So you've got these two boundaries and in between that, so the donut itself, that is where our recovery can happen. And in between that is where our communities should exist and can exist and can exist in harmony. So I just wanted to touch very briefly on, on those two, two circles and what those mean to me. So I think in terms of our outer circle and our ecological ceiling, our mana whenua in Aotearoa can give us tips about that. So. Um, you know, when you, it's, it's mandated under Te Tiriti or Waitangi that there's a protection clause for our natural taonga, um, such as, you know, Dr. Nana just talk, talked about that. And that's really just acknowledging that the ancestral people that are, you know, say here in Wellington, uh, Ngāti Tūtua and Te Atiawa, Taranaki Whanui, or where I'm from in the Waikato or, or on the east coast of Ngāti Awa, we have that ancestral matauranga or knowledge of what those ecological limits are. So we can tell you, uh, you know, which areas of a particular place are used for what or best for, say, growing different vegetables or um, for, you know, catching inanga or whitebait or, or eels or anything like that. We can, we can tell you those things and we can notice um, differences in what our papatuanuku is telling us. So, for example, there's a... Um, there's a, a puna, a spring from where I'm from, and and some of my whānau can just see the difference in the amount of bubbles that are coming to the surface that can tell us different things about the whole water of that waterway. So what I'm saying here is that we should work with mana whenua and let them lead that in order to set that the outside limits of our recovery, because that is where we can't, you know, we can't leave that space. Um, and just looking at Wellington, for example, you know, there's not one waterway in this region that is healthy. Um, you know, we're, we're about to build a landfill on the border of Zealandia, which is which is the home of so many of our native endangered um, manu species. And so, you know, we've really exhausted those rings, so we really need to bring it back in. And this is relevant to the recovery because we can actually create jobs. We can create jobs to, to bring that back in. So we can create jobs uh, when people need to weed invasive species. We can create jobs for people to do planting, riparian planting along our waterways to, to bring back inanga and tuna to, to filtrate the water and make sure that it, that it can serve purposes like mahinga kai and spiritual purposes. And um, 
I think all of this has to happen through mana whenua having an authentic seat at the table. So we need to be resourcing Iwi so that they can participate around the table. Looking at the inner space, and this is the, the social kind of, the social net that I think local government and central government play a massive role. So we've got that outer circle, the inner circle here. We're talking about fundamental human rights here. We're talking about access to, to clean water. We're talking about access to housing that actually doesn't make you sick and that is warm and dry and healthy um, and, and conserves energy. We're talking about the ability to get around town in a way that doesn't take away other people's right to fresh and clean air. We're talking about creating a lifestyle that means that everybody in our community can have a purposeful um, and fulfilling lifestyle. So I think the two major things that local government need to do to address this, um, I guess in the immediate interim, is we need to really get rid of this out of sight, out of mind um, mindset. And, and, we, and you can see this so heavily in the way that we deal with our water and the way that we deal with our waste. We just flush, it comes into our house, we do what we want with it and we just chuck it away and it's somebody else's problem. It's actually our problem. And I think that there's lots of opportunities during the recovery to address those, address the way that we dispose of our waste and address the, the source of that waste to, um, to look at the ways that we are resilient in terms of having access to water. So I think in terms of local and central government, like we need to be bold and courageous enough to develop systems that move away from wasteful consumer mindsets. And in my opinion, um, it isn't actually on individuals to have to make those individual lifestyle choices to be better people. It's actually us as decision makers that need to make it accessible for everybody, including those uh, with less um, disposable income and including those with disabilities. And I'm almost done. Sorry, Fano, just been really rolled up. Lots of time to think. Um, and now back to the donor, we're thinking about this middle space and this is the place in which our communities can exist and thrive. And this is where we need to stimulate localization. So this, this is simple as, it means supporting local fruit and veggie growers, local bakers, um, saying to my neighbors, hey, I'm on board, I need some books to read, can I borrow some of your books and you can use my composting facilities. Um, it's about repurposing empty spaces around our communities to invest in regenerative, regenerative agriculture, urban agriculture, growing our own food, repurposing our soil, sequestering carbon. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not actually that keen for Maccas and KFC to come back because I've actually learned to be more self-sufficient and to, to draw more on my local context rather than this consumerist stuff that these big companies drive. Um, and I think some really tangible steps that local government... Um, uh, sorry, that the government, the central government can take to support this localization is giving us local authorities access to financing tools so that we can actually finance these solutions. Um, local government only has access to 11% of the overall GDP. Most successful and, and equal countries have access to up to 30% of GDP. So we really need to get greater access to those financing tools, such as congestion charging. That's a big one that I think we need to get that we need to look at. Another thing is that I think we need a bit of help with our infrastructural costs. So, so actually repurposing and, and, and getting rid of actually those out of date models around water infrastructure, community housing and, and, and public transport and making sure that it's fit for purpose and sustainable. So very finally, um, what does that have to do with communities? Um, I think communities aren't things that come about through being in the same room as one another. And actually we can create more opportunities for communities to come together through these localized solutions. Um, we actually create solutions when we, uh, we actually create communities when we do that through finding solutions together and we work together on purposeful projects and initiatives and mahi together. So um, all I'll say to the people watching is that you have the power um, as decision makers, I would say that the conservative um, parts of Aotearoa are definitely organising right now. They are telling us, don't increase rates, uh, make you know cut costs. Um, they're telling us to take all of these cross-cutting measures. If we don't have you know our progressive population in Aotearoa saying no job loss, we want investment and sustainability. We want to re we want to change the way that we do business as usual then that really gives us the mandate to actually cast that net that doesn't, uh, sorry, to get rid of that net that doesn't work anymore and to create a new one that actually works for everybody. And that like Dr. Nana says, we can leave for our future generations. So that's what I'll leave with you. Ka te ruha, ka hau te rangatahi and tōra mai tato. Kia ora, Tamitha. Um, thank you. Um, I'm one of your constituents and uh, now I'm increasingly pleased 
uh, to be so. Um, and just as it was really refreshing hearing uh, Ganesh as an uh, economist talk about um, being kaitiaki to resources, it's very refreshing to hear a, a, a city councillor um, talk the way that, uh, that you're talking about the role uh, that you have and that city council has. So thank you. Please stay on the line um, because obviously we're going to be coming um, back to you for a bit of a discussion at the moment. Um, and I just want to say before we bring on our third panelist, just a reminder that if you've got questions, please put them in the chat function uh, in on your screen. Um, if you don't know where that is, have a look at the bottom of your screen for the chat function. Also, we're live streaming this on YouTube and you can invite your whānau and your friends to join us there if you haven't already. Now, after we've heard from our next panelist, um, we will carry on reimagining our communities and there will be time for some of those questions that you've been putting in the chat function there uh, at the end. Now, um, our next panelist is Professor Philippa Howden Chapman from Otago University's Department of Public Health. Um, and Philippa, I just want you to, uh, can I ask you just to put your camera on please uh, and join us uh, in the session. Apparently the host has stopped it. Ah, then there was light. No, start video. Apparently it's been stopped centrally. Mm. I'll just let our tech team sort that. We can certainly hear you. We just can't see you at the moment. Well, shall I start? <laughs> I didn't turn it off actually. Somebody else did. Uh, I'll, I'll try once more and then I'll just talk. Here we go. You're on my own. Fabulous. Thank you for thank you for joining us. <laughs> You're welcome. Tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi ki te kupapa o tēnā rā. And very interesting to hear the thoughts of people um, before me. And um, I've been thinking actually locally. Um, we were asked to live locally in our bubbles, and that's meant that whereas I'm normally in an office inside. I've been able to walk around the neighborhood and I found that a very interesting um, because of course some people don't um, feel very separate from their own community and they don't often, they may not have computers and stuff to have online communities. Um, there are some people who are very isolated and I really admire the social workers and the, the housing officers and the people who go and actually visit these people. And I hope that the new communities that we imagine give credit actually to those people. Uh, I mean, I've noticed on my walks around and going up into the, um, um, the green belt, there's some amazing work by volunteers. And that, that's come back to me very newly because uh, I see all the planting that they've done and the clearing of the tracks. And there's a wonderful lot of resources locally. But like the, the people who've spoken before, I think the power of government is actually something that's come to me even clearer um, because I work in a department of public health and I, I'm very interested in how politics are framed. And I think the, 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 not only is there resourcing passing to people who are in need for no fault of their own at the moment, um, supplementing incomes, um, providing capital for businesses, but the, the government, which of course includes um, um, you, <laughs> you both, uh, I think has made frequent acknowledgement of all who have contribute to society. And it's a very unusual situation that the people who are considered essential to society are not those with qualifications and lots of money and wealth, but those workers who are doing um, jobs that are often at risk to themselves. And I think that's a very, very big shift in New Zealand society. As um, a lot of the prime ministers talk is about we rather than you. And I think that's, I think that's um, very important. I, I, I'm, I studied the, one of our previous recessions um, with Finnish colleagues, um, the big one in 1991. And there was a very striking finding from that. We had 8% unemployment then. The Finns had 16% um, unemployment. So double the unemployment. We were both countries about the same size. We both have an unenviable record of very having very high youth suicide. 
Now, for those of you who weren't born in 1991, uh, that was the period where we had the mother of all budgets and the government then, Ruth Richardson, decided, okay, we're gonna deal with this by being austerity. So, so benefits were cut back, um, housing benefits were reduced and what left us with a residue of low-income families that really struggled and that legacy of still children in poverty. And what happened is that in, in New Zealand, the youth suicide rate um, went up higher than it had been before. Finland, which had double our rate initially, said, no, no, we're all in this together. They proportionally cut the incomes of high income people and medium income people. They did lots and lots of um, active labor market policies. They really um, made sure that people were included. No one was thrown out of the walker and their su youth suicide rate reduced. And it always seemed to me that that was a very important lesson that we had to remember next time we have a big economic shock. So I think including people and making them feel socially included and important is actually very, very important, as well as the factors that people can't live on air and good wishes. So when we emerge from this, um, this um, the lockdown, I'm really looking forward to re-engaging with um, our neighbours, local goods and, and businesses. Um, but I also think there's going to be um, very long uncertainty. So that trust and goodwill that we've built up, we've got to make really sh sure that we demonstrate that each day. And finally, as someone who's lucky enough to be um, on the board of Kayanga or the New Housing New Zealand, I am daily convinced that the investment in sustainable infrastructure is absolutely critical. Um, it, infrastructure and in housing and remediating all the land that we've polluted, getting our sewerage properly, getting distributed energy using um, solar panels. We have to do this. We've been very, very slow to do this. And we know that infrastructure lasts a long, long time to pick up uh, Ganesha's point. And we know how badly that was done in the past. We just invest in roads. It lasts a long time, but it's polluting and it's going in the wrong directions with carbon emissions. So my imagining communities is that we can have more walks and more connections between Greenbelt, that there's more parks around in the inner city. Um, but I think we have the fabric, both in the physical fabric, but also in the trust and goodwill and the good humor that people have um, shown. So I'm, I'm excited what the future can be, but I don't think we should be any doubt that we're in for a very difficult period for quite a long time. So we're going to need to show that araha daily, I think. Kilda, thank you, Philippa. Well, um, I'm just feeling quite chuffed at having such inspirational kōrero from our panellists tonight. And I know that there's so much more where this came from, right? I know that there are people across the country from all sorts of backgrounds and experiences that we, I believe, so strongly have got what we need here in Aotearoa to make our place so great. And it's about working together. I, I've picked up some notes um, from all three of your kōrero, Timotha, and the working year thing has come through all of you and particularly um, mana whenua leadership and working with mana whenua, all of us from all backgrounds. I live in Tamaki Makoto. I'm actually not mana whenua to where I live here, um, but I would love to and will continue to work with mana whenua and various communities um, to put up the best that we've got on an environmental, social, cultural jobs front as we possibly can. And mm -hmm. Uh, Philippa, everyone has a role to play. For far too long, we've had a very thin and narrow vision of who is successful, who makes a contribution. Mm -hmm. And I think you were touching on all of that, all of us having a, a contribution to make. And that's mm -hmm. not dependent on whether we are in paid employment or not, or whether we are in a particular type of employment or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and that actually even being supported 
to simply survive and thrive as best as you can mm -hmm. is a contribution in and of itself. Um, not everybody can be in paid employment, but what else do we count as a contribution? Mm -hmm. And uh, Ganesh, I, I too can't get away from the kaitaki role of receiving from our tupuna and passing on to our descendants, as I know that James, that, that really um, pushed James's lights as well. And I think, um, James, you might have some more thoughts. There's just a little bit of time for us to tease out any further thoughts that any of you might want to add and pick up from each other's cordial. Well, um, just, just go for it. We've got a bit of time uh, and we'll pick up some questions from others shortly as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, Ganesh, um, I'll start off the conversation with you. Um, you know, everybody here has said what a uh, period of disruption we are starting to live through. And I think, you know, we're only really just starting to see it now. I think it's obviously going to snowball um, the, the longer it goes on. Um, but one of the things that we have an opportunity to disrupt uh, is inequality. Um, and one of the things I'm interested in is, is this link, and you know, Tamitha referred to the donut economics model that Kate Raworth has been uh, pushing around. Can you articulate the link? Because I've always struggled with this. Um, we always assert that there is a link mm -hmm. um, between social and economic inequality on the one hand and climate change on the other. Mm. Yeah, that one's from... I'm not sure you might have to give me a bit more rope on that one. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's a new one on me. Where are we coming from? Um, well, can I, can I jump in? Not, yeah. I, I, if you're thinking of the, the societies like the Danish one um, that we're quite closely, we like to follow. I mean, they have a very low level of income inequality and that seems to be related to a very strong commitment to sustainability. You know, they shifted themselves from a, um, a car dominated society in the 50s and 60s to most people cycling everywhere. So it's like, and it's reinforcing as people meet each other on the streets and the, and the air is fresher, then that's, that's much better. If you're driving around on a Jaguar and going as fast as you can, um, you don't care really about what other kind of lives people live and, and how, how to share the road. I think, I think I'd go back to um, just recognising or defining what are our objectives? What is that? What are our measures of success? Uh, and, and, and that's part of the conversation we've got to have with community so that we actually start valuing things like um, the essential workers that are currently keeping us alive, literally. Um, and, and, and it's that word value, um, which I think we've really got to unpick um, because that's supposed to be driving our decision making in terms of resource allocation or as, as economists in terms of what business we start up. But what do we as a people actually want to value? And do we actually value a, a, a more equal distribution? Or do we value the uh, uh, people's abilities to have opportunities? Um, and, and I think the other thing that we are beginning to value now is this fact that we actually do have a community and a government or government or communities to fall back on to, to catch us when we fall. Um, and I think those sorts of things, um, and, and, and that undoubtedly is gonna go on towards those, those natural resources that we have. Do we actually honestly value them? Uh, value them in a, in a sense of um, what well-being do they give us as opposed to the market value that the, the financial markets put on them and actually recognise that those two concepts of value are different. And that's when we start, and it sounds academic, but if we can nail those, then we can actually start figuring out a way to make the market or change the market so that the values it gives us is more representative of the value that we actually put on those things. So for example, we actually start paying a living wage, if not more to those essential workers, because we actually value them. And we actually, um, we actually pay for the water that we use because we value it. So it is a treasure. It's not something that we want to use unless we actually have to use it. And the way we use it, we make sure we don't um, make a mess of it. We make sure we don't damage it after we use it. Those are the sorts of things that um, it's, yeah, it, it's around that, that discussion around what we value. What are our objectives? Why are we here? 
Absolutely. Uh, we've got other questions. Um, I'll qu quickly check with you, Tamitha, whether you wanted to add anything into that one at all. Oh, well, no, Kate's part. I think that was um, summarised. Great. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we've got another question that I think is relevant to what you've all been talking about from our audience. Um, wondering how we can tie in the lessons we learn from COVID-19 uh, to build our resilience against climate change and see if there's anything, any thinking that we can sort of take over to that discussion as well. Um, for any of you to, to have a go at that. Well, one, one thing I've noticed is it's, it's hard for young people to know what the environment was like before there were so many cars around. And uh, one thing I've taken great delight in, and lots of people have said it to me, is that, well, the air is much fresher. Mm. Uh, we, the birds are around, We've got piwaka wakas, little fantails going all the way around the garden. And, and I think we see a much more um, balanced environment and there's a lot of pleasure in that. And so I think uh, th that's one thing we can learn from COVID-19 is that, if we, if we don't use cars as much, if we walk around and cycle around more, we give much greater chance to um, the natural environment and, and, and the pollution that comes from, particularly from transport, aside from agriculture, is our major area mm. in, which, in which we're emitting carbon. So if we can get rid of that and bring the birds back, that's a wonderful, a wonderful exchange. I think the the other thing that I would um, pick up on in terms of what we've learned is two. One is we can't border ourselves off from the rest of the world. You know, climate change impacts all of us, and here we've got COVID nineteen. We had nothing to do with it, and it's it's here. It's all of us, and it doesn't make much use. It's not much use to start pointing fingers at who's who's at fault and who has to put it right because we all do. Um, it's irrespective of who's at fault or not. I, the other thing in terms of being in lockdown, I think it just might help people start thinking about, do we actually need all of the stuff that we have to go out and get every day, every week? You know, this horrendous scenario that this, the shops were closed for more than two days in a row and, and the world was about to fall apart on us. Do we actually really need all of the stuff? And so getting back to this idea that, you know, the fundamentals that underpin all our business models and our economic models is more is better. Well, when are we actually going to start seriously questioning? Because we actually have survived. And most of us, and I, I will admit, I'm in, a com I'm in a comfortable position, I'm in a privileged position, and I can probably say that. But I would think that if we seriously looked at it, apart from the financial stress, that undoubtedly the stress of the uncertainty of whether your job's going to be there, in terms of actually being able to access food, being able to put um, food on the table, being able to clothe ourselves, being able to wash, being able to get up and indeed go to work every morning. It actually hasn't been, from my perspective, actually hasn't been that difficult, to be honest. Um, and you're talking about transport. Do I really have to go to work every morning and get on a bus or get into a car and go six, seven K down the road and park the car, park the car in the car park and go to work physically? I, might want to do that a couple of days a week, but do I have to do that every? That changes the way we design cities and towns. Yeah, but Ganesh, I, I think you and I are probably in a, a, a very privileged position. Oh, undoubtedly, so undoubtedly. In the city, yeah. I've seen three people living in vans, and I think um, if you if you we know a third of the population, half the population doesn't have any savings to fall back on, and that's the kind of scary thing about how quickly a shock like this is, can come. And I've been very impressed in the way that we've mobilized as a society to protecting people because it'd be pretty grim if you were in a, a, a large household, ha, ha, didn't have any shopping and didn't have any resources to fall back on. So I think a lot of that is still quite hidden and it's pretty serious. Oh, and, and, and understood. And I don't want to underplay the, the um the the stresses that many are facing was just my point about the do we really need everything that we um have to go out and shop for every other day because mm. yeah it's that consumer materialistic 
society model that we've got. I'd like some of it, but do we really need all of it? Uh, again, um, a curious statement coming from an economist, because of course, um, yeah. economic orthodoxy would suggest that uh, actually you need um, that consumption spending to kind of fuel the economy and, and employ That's the big model, yes, very much so. Some of those assumptions are going to be up in the air. Tamitha, um, I've got a question for you. Um, territorial authorities are obviously doing a lot of work right now um, and thinking about what the post-COVID-19 world looks like um, for local government. Um, how confident are you uh, that the territorial authorities and central government are going to be able to get it together <laughs> uh, and, and cooperate to be able to um, coordinate all the different things that need coordinating at the different levels of government in New Zealand? Just in the, in the experience that you've had of central government so far and the time that you've been in local government. In terms of our recovery? Yeah, that's right. Um, it seems to me, just, just in my six months since being elected, that it actually it isn't necessarily us needing to work together or, or, or find opportunities to do that. It's more that there needs to be the, the will, will of the people for that to happen in the first place. And um, I guess for that reason, I think it's, it's you know, if we can, if, if our communities are mobilising and, and telling us exactly what they need from us, from exactly what they want from us, um, that's the best way that we can actually get, I guess, any progressive change done. Because like I said uh, in my um, court at all earlier, um, there is a very strong, um, I guess, more conservative uh, body of people who are mobilising. Um, you know, the Taxpayers Union have been very active lately. Um, it's funny. Um, and, you know, they're, they're calling and riling up all of these people to say to, you know, uh, territorial authorities, um, we want zero rates increases. We want but at the same time, we want to retain levels of service, um, you know, and, and asking all, all of these things and asking that we take these austerity measures. And unless we have a, a, just a public pushback against that of people saying, actually, no, now's not the time to be conservative. Now's the time to inject money in a way that moves our society towards the transition that we need to make anyway, um, then our hands are ultimately tied because it just looks like we're throwing money into areas that are um, wish list items or, um, you know, kind of inappropriate given the, the, the circumstances. So um, mm -hmm. I think that, that, that's what I'd say in that respect. But I, I just yeah wanted to say that I really agree with what um, both um, Dr. Nana and Philippa have said. I mean, it's been amazing to see in such a short period of time how much of a you know, regeneration our native manu have had. I've, I've, I've seen so much more birds than, than I've ever seen before. Um, I have piwaka waka flying into my house all the time. I'm kaka perching outside. They're, they're all very emboldened lately and, and, and very curious. Um, kaka tapping on my windows. And um, so, so it's, it's amazing and incredible seeing it as a young person and not having seen that before um, to, to see how such a, in such a short period of time, if we do what we need to do, that we can actually bring life to that again. And um, I mean, also also agree with what um, Dr. Nana was saying as well, you know. Um, but yeah, I think there, there needs to be that that balance of, of political will from the people if we want to work together in order to move away from these systems that exploit people and planet. We need that, that push as well to balance out that voice. Uh, Tamitha, you've, you've picked up on a, a, a very important theme of um, as we move to a, a, a better way of living and reimagining Aotearoa, everyone needs to feel secure about their families and their future and think that's at the heart of all of these big crises that we're facing. Mm -hmm. How do we um, design our communities in, in a way that is resilient to climate change while at the same time ensuring that people who are already struggling aren't going to have to struggle even more so. And that begs the question of uh, people who have more than they will ever need. How can we spread our resource and our wealth in a way that is more sustainable, in a way that is just, and we can get on with this work that we need to do together? So thank you for that. I have got something for you, Philippa. Uh, 
how do we prioritize an upgrade of building standards to minimize operational costs and maximize health outcomes? There you go. <laughs> that is a very nice question, whoever asked that. I mean, I do think that's really important. We have a building code that's over 10 years old and that's ridiculous. Um, I, I, I think this is the one, one of the areas which I hope is going to get a lot of more money in the budget. We really need to upgrade the building code so that we, um, when we're retrofitting buildings, it's up to an, a higher standard that we can do walls and so forth and that we generally require houses that are going to last another 80, 90 years. So, Absolutely, I totally agree. I've been on the three telephone calls about this today. So I, I hope whoever asked that question um, and I will have some success at this because I think it's absolutely critical and it's and it's it's where we spend most of our time. Of course, we're spending all our almost all our time here now, but young people and older people spend a great deal of their time time inside the houses and we have to get them better so that we don't have to use a lot of energy to actually keep them warm and dry and safe. I think that, that's one of the critical shovel ready projects if you want to take it to cabinet. Yeah. That's shovel ready. Yeah. Let's redo all of the houses in New Zealand. We don't have to build any new ones, the ones we've got, because yeah. that will employ builders and plumbers and electricians, yeah. local, uh, just, you know, just get past the shovel ready has to be a road. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a discussion going on as to whether those people can do it under the um, lockdown three conditions. And I think they are going to be able to. That's great because we're only third of the way through retrofitting houses at the moment. So it's still two thirds to go. Yeah, so we do very much. Uh, this is something where the, all the parties, except that party, can agree that these are important. So let's hope that we can go forward. Well, I, I think that's a sort of a great place to close it, actually, because um, what you're suggesting there is the link between the economic recovery for COVID, um, some of the other long term challenges that have been lying around, not getting a lot of attention in New Zealand um, and uh, the um, ability to uh, kind of address some of the climate related challenges that, you know, inefficient, um, uh, you know, houses and, and buildings do. And I was reading over the weekend, um, I can't remember who it was, Philippa, but I'm sure that you know who, who it was, was making the argument that um, residential construction and maintenance yeah, yeah. Uh, employs more people per dollar spent than um, vertical construction of tall yeah. buildings yeah. or um, horizontal construction of roads, um, which is largely done by machines. Yeah. And so if we want to employ a lot of people, fix a long-term challenge and um, at least tackle part of the problem of uh, climate change, actually um, fixing up our houses would be a great place to start. So um, I'm not allowed to talk about the budget, so uh, <laughs> I won't, but watch this space. Um, look, I'm afraid, I know it feels like we were just getting warmed up, but uh, we have come to the end of our um, of our time together. Um, just before Marama um, gives us the mihi and the karakia, um, there is a survey uh, that we're asking um, all of the participants to fill out. So uh, I think that's going to be popping up on your screen shortly. Um, and uh, we would ask that you uh, fill out that survey and also share it uh, with other people, um, because we want to know what you think about where we should prioritize uh, the recovery and what you think reimagining our communities means for you. Um, again, thank you very much, um, Professor um, Philippa Howden Chapman, Councillor Tamitha Paul, Dr. Ganesh Nana. You've been absolutely fabulous. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, this mm -hmm. evening. And to everybody else, please fill out the survey. Thank you so much for your time. Marama. Thank you, Gorda. No, thank you. Kia ora, James. Uh, it's, it's been pretty special, actually, having this corridor with you all. We're going to need to do lots more of this um, across our communities and our households across the country and in fact across the world. Uh, these are the ideas, the projects and the values that are going to be really important for all of us. Uh, so I have, uh, I think, a, a, a sort of end mihi um, that uh, was actually written by uh, 
our Scotty Morrison, not ScoMo from Australia, our Scotty Morrison, um, many will know from Te Karere uh, presenter, but has been an incredible um, te reo and tikanga champion, a uh, community leader among us for a long time, has written and gifted to all of us a, a karakia of sorts. Um, and I will finish us off with this because uh, I think it's incredibly fitting. Tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro, tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i waho, ki a tau wai te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, haumie, huie, taiki. Come forth from above, come forth from below, come forth from within and from the environment, vitality and well-being for all, strengthened in unity. Kia ora. Kia ora. Good evening. Ngā mihi. Thank you.